and welcome to AAAS Member Central's latest webinar. AAAS Member Central is an exclusive benefit of membership in the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I am Adam Rubin, scientist, comedian, and author of Science Careers column Experimental Error. I'll be your moderator for the hour. Today's audio webinar will feature presentations and a Q&A panel discussion on crowdfunding, appealing to the online community for much needed research money. Crowdfunding is a fairly new idea that's only recently caught on, largely due to the success of Kickstarter, which is a website that provides a platform for those with a creative bent, mostly artists and inventors and tinkerers, to fundraise their dream projects. In 2012, the public pledged nearly $320 million to Kickstarter projects. Over 18,000 of those pro uh, projects were successful. In other words, they reached their funding goals. Not surprisingly, crowdfunding has grabbed the attention of the science community, who's taken the simple idea and adapted it for its own needs. With federal and state funding for science either flat or on a downward trend, many young scientists are searching for new revenue streams to fund their research and its related expenses, such as travel, food, or hiring staff for field work. Crowdfunding holds huge potential for scientists who can effectively capture the imagination of the public and get them to open their wallets to support science. In addition to bypassing the grant proposal process, crowdfunding gets scientists directly engaging with the public. But this is a new field, and like any new field, the waters are only now being tested. For this great success, there has also been failure. Not all projects reach their funding goals, and like all science, not all projects produce results. So how does this all work? That's where our speakers come in. They've each had a go at crowdfunding and will show us how they did it and what they learned along the way. They'll share tips on how to reach funding goals and give you an opportunity to ask them questions. Let's meet these crowdfunding pioneers. First, Jarrett Burns. Jarrett is an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. His research focuses on the causes and consequences of food web complexity in marine systems. Burns is the co-founder of SciFund Challenge a website that helps scientists use crowdfunding to, to fund their research and as a way to get scientists to directly engage with the public. In 2011, his own SciFund project called Hey, Where's That Fish? received $4,600. Burns is also the author of the science blog I'm a Cordata, you're a Cordata. He received his undergraduate degree in biology from Brown University and his PhD in population biology from UC Davis. Burns served as a postdoctoral fellow at UC Santa Barbara and at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. Next we have Erica Hermson. Erica recently completed her MS in Conservation Biology at Antioch University, New England in Keene, New Hampshire. Her thesis focused on evaluating the effectiveness of a variety of bait types at luring cheetahs to target sites. In the summers of 2011 and 2012, Erica set up 35 motion-triggered camera traps in southern Kenya and evaluated the photographs to determine the frequency of visitation of cheetahs to different baits. She successfully raised $3,212 in crowdfunding through the site petridish.org. The money helped fund fuel for her transportation in Kenya. Erica works full-time as a consultant with Shaw Environmental and is ACK's volunteer and outreach coordinator. And our third speaker is independent scientist Ethan O. Perlstein. He is a former Lewis Sigler Fellow at the Lewis Sigler Institute for Integrative Genomics at Princeton University. Ethan completed a five-year independent postdoctoral fellowship at Princeton studying how complex drugs work in simple organisms, an approach that he calls evolutionary pharmacology. He's currently working on a record-breaking $25,000 crowdfunding project to determine where amphetamines accumulate in the mouse brain. He attended Columbia College and received a BA in sociology in 2001. In 2006, Ethan received a doctorate in molecular and cell biology from Harvard University, working in the chemical biology lab of Professor Stuart Schreiber. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm going to also let you guys know a word on our format is for everybody. Our, each panelist is going to speak for about seven to ten minutes. Their slides will appear on the right side of your screen. You can submit a question at any time by typing into ask a question on the bottom left of your, of your screen and then clicking send. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Please keep them short and direct them to a particular individual or to the whole panel. You may refer to our guest speakers as Jarrett, Erica, and Ethan. Let's start with Jarrett Burns, who will tell us about SciFund Challenge, an experiment to see if scientists can fund a portion of their research by crowdfunding. Jarrett? Uh, thank you very much, Adam, and uh, thank you for, to AAAS for inviting me this morning. 
Uh, I'm here to talk about the SciFun Challenge, a project that I ran along with Jai Ranganathan uh, to look at science crowdfunding uh, and science engagement. Uh, so briefly, what is the SciFun Challenge? Uh, the SciFun Challenge is an organization that brings together scientists twice a year so far uh, to all run their crowdfunding projects together at the same time. We provide a month of training and community discussion in the lead up to running projects and then actively help with promotion during the run of projects themselves. So that's what SciFun does, but um, what is it really? Um, SciFun Challenge is an experiment. Uh, Jai and I are both uh, trained and very interested in science outreach uh, and are really interested in how do we break down the walls of the ivory tower and bring science and society together. So we conceived of the SciFun Challenge as an experiment to ask, can scientists use crowdfunding to communicate their science and to simultaneously raise money for their own research. Uh, SciFun provides a variety of different tools to participants, as well as a, a, a platform upon which they can communicate and learn more about crowdfunding. Uh, so what does it provide? Well, first off, it provides training uh, via the SciFun blog, as well as a variety of discussions with experts in outreach uh, and video production. We actually provide training to participants in terms of how to put together a good and compelling proposal. The SciFun Challenge also provides a community. Uh, we're really all in this together. Project scientists are able to help each other out in the creation of their proposals, in critiquing each other's work, and then go on to support each other and promote each other's projects while they're actually running. So it's, it's a community process, which is a great way to get involved in crowdfunding the very first time. We're also really into online engagement and community building. So we provide resources via a Twitter hashtag. We have a Facebook page. We have a SciFun Google group and more. Uh, we provide a real extended online community that helps participants promote their projects and, and gives us a sense that, again, we're all in this together. So how have we done so far? Uh, oh, and sorry, lastly, we uh, provide a, an existing relationship with Rocket Hub. Um, so we have been running projects through Rocket Hub at scifund.rockethub.com. Uh, and so we facilitate scientists getting their projects up and running at Rocket Hub and try and, and ease the transition and the many technical hurdles that scientists face the very first time. So how have we done so far? Well, through three rounds so far with a variety of different round lengths in terms of number of days, uh, and a variety of uh, different numbers of projects, we've seen a lot of growth. Uh, we've seen a, a great uptick in the percent of projects funded at 100% so far. Uh, and we've been really excited to see that in three rounds, just three rounds, we've raised 200, uh, roughly $250,000 for science. So this has been uh, really huge and, and actually far more than Jai and I would have expected when we kicked off uh, this entire project to begin with. Um, so briefly, here's kind of what a, an individual round will look like, and the, the data that I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides all comes from round one. Um, so here's, here's the funding graph from round one, and you can see when any round uh, jumps or starts off, you see a big jump in funding. You see a lot of people getting in early and funding projects, and we have a sort of gradual flattening off in that sort of valley of malaise in the middle of a, a project. And then as you get towards the end of a round of crowdfunding, things jump up again. So there's a really nice flow to uh, how people are engaged and how people are funding uh, projects. And in fact, this pattern mirrors broadly what's seen in a variety of other disciplines that crowdfund their work. We can also see that small donations really drive SciFund. We've had a lot of success in projects in the zero to $2,000, well, uh, at, at around $2,000, um, particularly in the $1,500 to $2,000 range. And those are projects really that uh, are fantastic for funding, say, a summer of graduate student research. Uh, so that's been a real area where we seem to have gotten a, a lot of funding. And we can also see that most donations, uh, particularly in our first round, are small, so in the $20 to $30 range. So that's a little bit about patterns of donation uh, and success, but what really leads to a successful crowdfunding project? 
So shown here, I have kind of a flow chart uh, that describes a, a variety of different statistical analyses that we did of our round one data, and then we have ongoing for some of our other data. Um, the real take home here is that if you want to understand how a project gets funded, you have to go all the way back to an individual scientist's online presence or their, their outreach that they're doing. Uh, we quantified in our surveys of project participants the amount of outreach people did by looking at uh, blogging. We find that blogging is a very common science outreach tool amongst many of our, our members. And we found that as people blogged more, they built a larger audience through social media. So we quantified their audience through social media, and we found that the bigger an audience they had, the more people were coming in and viewing their projects. And those project views, combined, of course, with friends and family, uh, because mom wants to fund your science too, uh, led to uh, more and more donations. What was really interesting is that we found as more donations rolled in, once a project was able to achieve 100% funding, donations actually grew in size. Uh, so you actually had more people funding, and often at a slightly higher level. People like a success story. But the overall message of this is that in order to successfully crowdfund a project, you need to build a scientific fan base. It's not necessarily possible to be an overnight success and raise hundreds of thousands of dollars or even tens of thousands of dollars. That audience engagement is key. Um, you can kind of think of this as, as the rock star model on one hand, uh, that if you are able to build a significant and large audience for your work, that audience will reward you. We've seen this time and time again in, in other crowdfunding segments. If you look at, say, Amanda Palmer or George Takei, these are people that have enormous audiences and are able to leverage enormous amounts of funds. But perhaps a way that's a little bit more comfortable for scientists to think about this is that crowdfunding really works on the NPR model. That if you build an audience slowly through time that loves your work, and then periodically come to them and say, hey, I, I need some funds to do this great work that you already care about, that that's going to be a success in terms of bringing funding into your lab and your research program. Uh, it also suggests that that ongoing engagement is absolutely essential in order to make crowdfunding work. So to sum up, um, to crowdfund your science, you'll need to build an audience for your work, that there are a variety of different tools that you can use to begin building an audience even now, even before you start crowdfunding the very first time, although crowdfunding is certainly a, a, a compelling way to launch your outreach career, as it were. Uh, second, that getting trained in outreach through media and social networking training can be absolutely crucial. Uh, and lastly, if we really want to promote crowdfunding outreach and engagement, uh, working to change academic culture and policy in order to have universities actually uh, look fondly on these activities is going to be a real benefit to all of us. And the benefits are huge. I mean, I've talked uh, about one aspect of how crowdfunding uh, can benefit you and your lab by building an audience. Uh, but if we think about it, there are some huge benefits to crowdfunding, that we can build bridges between science and society that we can enhance science literacy by getting outside of the ivory tower and really bringing our science out into the world around us. In many ways, um, really the, the best way that I find to think about crowdfunding in science is that it's an opportunity for outreach, but an opportunity for outreach that gives back to you, to your lab. Um, I, I like to look at it in many ways as funded outreach training for the early participant in crowdfunding, particularly for graduate students and early career scientists. But then as you go on, it can really become a focal point of the outreach mission of your lab. Uh, here is your platform. Here is the place where you can focus a lot of your efforts and have it benefit both your lab as well as people that are the audience uh, for your work. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jarrett. Uh, now let's hear from Erica Hermson, who used the crowdfunding site PetriDish.org to fund her cheetah project in Kenya. Eric will t Erica will tell us how she raised funds for her project and what she was able to do with the money. Erica? Hi, and thanks so much for having me. Yeah, again, my name is Erica Hurston, and I am a conservation biology candidate at Antioch University in New England here in Keene, New Hampshire, and I'll be talking to you about raising funds through PetriDish.org. First of all, I'll give you a little introduction of um, my experience with PetriDish. I'll tell you about the requirements, the rewards, how I promoted my project, the outcome of my project, and lessons learned. 
So again, my name is Erica Hermsen, and as part of my graduate thesis research, I traveled to Kenya to conduct a study using camera traps to determine the effectiveness of different bait types at luring cheetahs. And my budget was quite large uh, for a master's degree. It was $38,000, which included transportation to and from Kenya, from the United States, as well as the 35 camera traps, each costing upwards of $500. And again, uh, fuel for cars and also for um, my research assistant, too. So I was looking around for different sources for funding, and through a professor, I heard about PetriDish.org. Um, it is a crowdfunding website that focuses on science-based projects, and backers receive donations, um, uh, and they, they, backers receive rewards from the researcher in return for their donations. It's an all-or-nothing system, meaning that if a backer donates a certain amount of money, or I'm sorry, pledges that amount of money, they don't actually get the donation taken away from their account unless the researcher uh, reaches their budget within their time frame. So for example, my budget was set at $2,500. If I had only raised $2,495 within my, amount, my time frame of raising that money, none of the backers' cards would have been charged and uh, I would have unfortunately had a failed project. Lucky for me, my project was successful. So here is the dashboard of the PetriDish.org website. You can see how things are laid out with the completed projects and featured projects. And anyone um, who is affiliated with a university or a nonprofit can sign up and post their research uh, on this website. So as I had said previously, you must be affiliated with a university or a nonprofit that's registered in the U.S. in order to have your project be featured on PetriDish.org. You also need to have an Amazon business account, which uh, I just created once my project was accepted into PetriDish. Also, uh, once your project is accepted, you need to have a profile set up that you do yourself. So I had to create a three-minute video, and I was unfamiliar with making videos in the past, so I just used Windows Movie Maker, a very simple video, and I posted photographs of my proposed study. I also had a lengthy project description, as well as my budget, of course, and a timeline for raising those funds. And then most importantly, I laid out a set of rewards for backers as far as what incentives they would receive for donating to my project. So here's the profile of my project on PetriDish.org. As you can see, my uh, budget listed on the right corner there is $2,500, and I'm very thankful that I was able to raise 128% uh, of my goal, up to $3,212, using uh, nine different backers. A, a short list right there is um, are my incentives or my rewards for the backers. And it can go as low as $50. I've seen other projects uh, even offer for $10 donations, uh, little things. Um, I started mine at $50 and went up to $450 for my, um, my rewards. And I also have a description about my project, with, which would filter down a few pages, and uh, my three-minute video. Some examples for rewards, a uh, souvenir from Kenya was um, I, for a $150 donation. For a $450 donation, I offered four 8x11 camera trap photographs of the cheetahs that I had caught on camera. For $1,000, I offered naming rights to photograph cheetahs. Now, this was an idea of mine that didn't take off. Um, of course, I had to speak to the Kenyan government to make sure that this was okay <laughs> as far as um, they are the wildlife authority. So, it wouldn't necessarily be official to offer that, so I decided not to go for it. But um, just other ideas of things that you can offer for your backers. And of course, the higher, um, the more important or more interesting your reward, I think the, the more response you'll get from, from backers wanting to get those types of incentives. So I promoted my project using social media, especially Facebook, and a bit on Twitter as well. I also did, sent out a mass email um, to my friends and colleagues. I tapped into networks that I had from my professors. And also, my work was done through an organization called Action for Cheetahs in Kenya, or ACK. And with the director of that program, she also had her uh, social media sites and posted the link to petridish.org on her websites as well. 
I also had a running blog during my time in Kenya, and I would periodically post the link to pgdish.org. So pretty much heavy in, um, in using online support to get my promotion out of there, out, out to the world. So with the outcome, again, I raised $3,212, which is 128% of my goal, within 65 days of uh, the fundraising effort. I had nine backers total. I had one friend, three family members, and five strangers, which is folks that were outside of my social circle. My funds were used, uh, they were contributing to my fuel to get around in Kenya to all the different 30 bait station sites, which is quite extensive travel. So it was very helpful to have those extra funds for that. Some of the lessons that I learned um, through my experience of crowdfunding was that um, I was surprised to see that the majority of contributors, those nine strangers, were uh, the Petri Dish.org members and actually outside of my social media circle that I was using so heavily to promote my project. However, again, there were a few uh, family members and friends who picked up on, on my efforts to, to get out there on, on my social network. Uh, I thought that it was very important to have immediate follow-up once a backer had pledged money, uh, despite the fact um, this is before I even reached my goal of my budget, I sent an email just thanking them for the pledge, the initial pledge, just starting that, that contact between um, backers and myself. And also once my project, was, my project goal was reached and I was able to actually receive those funds, I again sent up a thank you and um, followed up with, with those rewards from those backers. And again, it's really good to do that, to retain those contacts for future projects. I'll definitely be tapping into those resources for future projects. Something that I didn't quite think through before I set up my rewards were the cost of those rewards. Um, purchasing not only just little bracelets and things, but uh, due to the amount of people that ended up backing me, it, it does kind of add up to, to purchase different, different gifts. Also the labor costs going into, um, for example, the photographs, printing out the photographs and matting them and then shipping them. I had three international backers, um, Germany, Australia, and um, one in Kenya as well. So shipping those out just cost a little bit. So to think about the, your rewards you're offering and, and the cost-benefit analysis of what you're, you're raising as far as your budget. So suggestions that I would make to people who are looking to crowdfund were to maintain communication with backers throughout your project um, from that initial pledge up until uh, receiving that donation and following up with your rewards. Also, keeping your budget, budget to a minimum, I initially posted a budget of $12,000 to PetriDish.org, and I did receive an email from the owner of PetriDish saying, um, you suggest that I lower it just to make it not so overwhelming for backers and to, to make them think that they can actually make a difference in my project. And uh, again, it was successful, so it was great. And low cost rewards, something um, that's easy to do is to offer a, a Skype date with um, any backers. This may be a, that's what I used for my $50 donation. Or sending pictures uh, online, or just keeping those costs low so that you get the most out of the donations that you receive from your backers. All right, so that is all I have for my, my project, and thank you so much for listening. All right, thank you, Erica. Our final speaker is Ethan O. Perlstein. Ethan thoroughly documented his crowdfunding campaign to raise $25,000 for his research on amphetamines. He's going to share with us what he learned along the way and give us some tips on what works and what doesn't work when you're appealing to the public for money. Ethan? Thanks, Adam, and I want to thank uh, Jared and Erica for laying out uh, their stories, and I think a lot of the themes that they hit I'll be touching on in, in our study, but I think we had a bigger sample size of donors, but we, I think that enabled us to do some, some data-driven analysis of the numbers and the networks that I'll describe uh, that I think adds some perspective uh, to what's been said. So again, um, I'm, I'm grateful to AAAS for inviting me to present my super secret formula for crowdfunding success. Uh, I'm Ethan Perlstein. I'm an open scientist. Uh, for five years, I had run an independent lab at Princeton University. Uh, now my lab exists on the cloud. You can find us at PerlsteinLab.com. You can follow my progress at ePerlstein. Uh, e. And so I want to tell you about our uh, success with a project we call Crowd for Discovery, um, or C4D. Um, so Crowd for Discovery is a collaboration between me and my lab, uh, David Solzer, a professor at Columbia Medical School, and lead project experimentalist Danny Karostashevsky. 
So we set out in the fall to raise $25,000. Uh, and we ended up uh, having a 52-day campaign. And this plot that I show here is the one that I like to kick off the uh, discussion with because I think it captures, um, it captures the different phases of, a, of a, what I think are a typical crowdfunding project. So, and, and for a frame of reference, I plot this, uh, this diagonal here, which, which I call constant growth, which would be how much you would be raising, about $481 each day if you were raising the same amount throughout your campaign. And so the point of this I, uh, is to show people when our campaign is doing, when we're above this line, we're, we're potentially going to get to our goal faster. But when we dip below that line, um, we're going to have to need, we're gonna use, we're need more time. Otherwise, we're not going to make it, and we're going to have to play catch up in the end. And that's actually what we ended up doing, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but the, the campaign usually starts off, like any campaign um, on the Internet, I think with a bunch of novelty buzz, uh, but eventually that kind of fades away, and then you have to have this slow, choppy, linear growth for most of uh, the campaign, and that's typical of many campaigns. Uh, if you look at Indiegogo's site, they, they summarize a lot of campaigns, and they see this too. Um, anyway, you have these sort of periods of choppy growth where you get some uh, a spurt of activity, then you get these slow periods, and then at the end you have to essentially make up a lot of ground. We had to, we had to make up about $5,000 in the last 24 hours, and so we had this uh, exhilarating hockey stick finish, which I'll talk about. Um, but I think in, in the end, we, we essentially ran a marketing campaign, and we, we put out a lot of messages on my social network, and outside my social network we had a lot of media uh, attention. Um, and so what, what I think the, the lessons that the, the big, big picture that I learned was if you combine your social networks and you combine some uh, external page views from, from referral traffic, and you put a lot of you know, elbow grease into it, you can, you can pull off a dream project in this sort of tens of thousands of dollar range. Um, and so I want to first talk about what were some of the effective media strategies uh, that worked for us, because we were fortunate to get uh, a lot of media buzz. Um, and you can see I've marked with these asterisks where we got written up. And, of course, we are a project that's looking at the accumulation of uh, methamphetamine uh, or amphetamines generally in, in mouse brain cells. And so we leveraged the Breaking Bad uh, meme. And so Mashable, for example, wrote a piece about us called Breaking Good. But what was interesting is that these media uh, events didn't necessarily correlate to a burst in traffic, uh, at least immediately. There might have been a slight lag. But for, for most of this middle stretch of this campaign, uh, it was essentially me getting uh, and, and Danny hustling to get you know, two or three donors uh, each day. And this is by direct email campaign, by Facebook uh, messaging, by, by Twitter broadcasting. Um, so it was, it was a lot of work. But in the end, I think uh, the most exciting part was this exhilarating uh, final push, which we didn't actually foresee because there had been no day like – a uh, $5,000 day throughout you know, the preceding 51 days. So we, we knew that we had to make up a lot of ground in a way that we had never done before. And so what, what I want to show here is that if you start a countdown at the last you know, at midnight of the, of the last 24-hour period, you can see that there were stretches. There were, there were, you know, we were making in an hour what we had been making in a, in a day in terms of fundraising. Um, and so if you look at the aggregate numbers, we raised $25,460 so from about 390 people. And so the average donation was around $64. But the median donation was much less at 25. So that's very so our campaign was very similar to other campaigns, uh, and I think not just science campaigns, but the crowdfunding campaigns in general. But is this really, you know, what, what do you what do you make of these numbers? And what I find actually quite remarkable is that there's so much more uh, growth potential. I put here uh, examples of two web comics, the Oatmeal and Saturday Morning Breakfast cereal. Uh, the Oatmeal was was a was a guy named Matt, uh, Matthew Inman, I think is his name, and he ran a campaign on Indiegogo to crowdfund a Tesla museum. And at some point in that campaign, he was raising $27,000 an hour. And then the, this last week, the Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial, not coincidentally, another webcomic, uh, launched a campaign on Kickstarter, and I think in the first day made $70,000. So scientists are nowhere near at the level of raising money as webcomics, but I think someday the lesson they can learn from the webcomics is that if you have a massive following, as Jared said, uh, if you have a massive fan base, you can activate them uh, using uh, social media, and you can get these phenomenal, uh, phenomenal growth, uh, fundraising rates. But in the end, we actually had to rely um, on a lot of uh, external media uh, and external uh, referral traffic to, to learn about our site. And I want to show you an example of one of the mo most successful marketing events during the campaign. So uh, there, was a site, there was a site called Hacker News, which is similar to Reddit, which is a site where people can share links, and then uh, the members of this community can, uh, can vote up or down something, and in that, in that way they self-police. Anyway, some, someone who was a supporter of our campaign posted a link to our, our campaign page, and I'm showing you data here of the number of times our video was played. 
and this data comes from the Vimeo site. You can see there was a spike of almost 1,000 page views in the middle of the campaign. That was because of this one little post. And so that also translated into almost $1,000 of donations. And when I asked some of the people who, were, you know, who gave in that day, a lot of them fit a kind of profile, people that you might think would read Hacker News. And for whatever reason, our project really resonated with them. And I think in the end, a lot of these, uh, these were men, actually, a lot of techie guys. And some of them told me that they, they actually had a personal interest in this because of, of ADD. So I think that was a really interesting lesson was the most, you know, we got written up by the economists. That was really awesome. Um, but this thing that was out of our control, somebody actually liked our, our marketing approach, and then we really resonated with a group of people. Um, but I want to now dig into a little bit into the numbers of who our donors were. So we had about 390 donors. Uh, this chart shows you what their sort of purchasing power was, or their funding power was, I should say. And what, what you notice is the trend that everybody sees, that a very few number of angel uh, uh, donors are what I jokingly call the Lexus demographic, and these are not coincidentally family and close friends. Uh, they sort of constitute a very small number of the donors, but they give a, a large amount of the, the goal. And of course, the, the, most of our donors were giving in this low range, our beer demographic. And I think our perk, our $25 perk of a 3D methamphetamine uh, mole molecule was a, was a really attractive draw. People, people told me this in feedback. So that's our, our general numbers. Uh, look, our donor, donor number looks very similar to most campaigns, I think. But who are these people in terms of uh, thinking about this through a network prism? So you consider the people who are in my network, um, in my social network, and that would include Twitter and Facebook. Um, and they represent, you know, a big chunk of, of who, who was giving money to the campaign. And, of course, there are those slivers at the very top, the orange and red, which are my family or, or a few friends who, for whatever reason, are not on any social networks. Um, there's a small contingent of people who are on both Twitter and Facebook who gave. But then there's this large group of people who are, who are, probably, who are in my network, but they're, they're, they're far away from me. They're not directly connected to me. Um, and that was actually, I think, a sizable chunk. And I think most of that was traffic drawn in from being talked about in the press. And so I just want to conclude by digging a little bit deeper into the social, uh, the social networks. And we, I use a program called Gephi, which is an open source program that lets you visualize graphs, uh, uh, in other words, social networks. So here is my, so my Facebook network represented as a, as a graph. Um, and what the number 17 refers to is that I got 17% of roughly 700 Facebook friends to, end, to, to give to the campaign. And what I want to show you in this little, uh, these graphs, this comparison here, is that the size of each circle, so each circle is a person or a node, as we say in graph theory speak. And the size of the node reflects how connected uh, each individual is. So these larger circles here represent you know, very important people in my life, my wife, my best friend from college, et cetera. So they have, they're a very large circle because they're connected to many of my friends as well. And the colors on, on this left uh, uh, network represent different uh, classes or clusters of, of friendship. So people from middle school, people from high school, et cetera. And what I did on the other, uh, this other graph to the right of it to compare is just two colors now. Yellow means a donor, blue means a not, uh, someone who didn't give. And what you can see is that there's no obvious uh, correlation between you know, what cluster someone belongs to, what period of my life they, they're from, and whether they're a donor or not, which I think is, is an interesting take-home message because I would have thought it was only my science friends, for example, who would be interested, not anyone else. Uh, it was true that in particular some science friends did, some science clusters did give more than the average. But in general, I think most of my friends, I think, were, were or at least 17% of my friends uh, were, got, got all those status updates and, uh, and ended up giving some money in the end. And then finally, the Twitter network analysis, the same kind of, um, same kind of graph here, except now this is what's called a directed graph, where I'm sort of the center of this graph because it's, this includes all of my followers. And so they, they follow me, but I don't necessarily follow them. And if you do the same kind of analysis where you break up the Twitter network into uh, clusters, for example, people who are into open science or people who are into genomics or whatever, and you do the same kind of donor overlay, again, there's not one particular subnetwork that really, um, that really donated in larger uh, numbers than the average. And so it was pretty spread out. In the end, the number was around 10%. So I have, at that time during the campaign, I had around 1,300 followers. So in the end, 10% uh, ended up giving. And the really remarkable thing was that most of that came at the very end, at the, that last day when we had that huge surge, uh, most of those people were actually coming from Twitter. So that was my experience, and I probably overtook, took up too much time, but now I'm really interested in hearing everyone's questions and feedback, so I'll, I'll hand this back to, uh, to Adam. Great. Thank you, Ethan. Now we're going to kick off the Q&A. As a reminder to everybody listening, you can submit a question at any time by typing into Ask a Question on the bottom left of your screen and clicking Send. Please, if you can, keep your question short and direct it to a particular individual or to the whole panel. You can also submit a question via Twitter at hashtag AAASWebinar. 
I'm going to start us off with a question that I have for the entire panel to answer. I know that in, in my research we're largely funded by grants from larger institutions, and so we, of course, have an obligation to do all the research that we've outlined in the grant when we applied for it. And um, we feel somewhat indebted to the organization that's given us the money to, to provide them with results that they will, um, basically the results that they believed they were funding. Uh, is that different when your, your funders are individuals? Do you feel an obligation to, to provide more literal, understandable, direct results? Jared, do you want to start this off? I mean, I'd be sure, happy no to problem. chime in. <clears throat> yeah, so this is Jared. Um, we actually suggest that, that project participants really create an ongoing outreach presence for themselves. So create a blog, create a, a regular place where people can come and get updates uh, from the work that they're doing, uh, either the work that they've uh, funded through SciFund or a, additional work that's going on in their lab. Um, my personal view is that as people go forward with crowdfunding, uh, if you crowdfund once, and don't give any follow-up to your donor base, what reason do they necessarily have to fund you a second time? So it, it really is a conversation. Um, funding is, is part of the picture, but it's about creating that relationship. And I think the people that are going to be most successful at using crowdfunding in the long term are going to be those that uh, keep people updated with their progress, what they're doing, what data they're producing, and, and what uh, research products are coming out of it. Ethan? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of am a big fan of the open science approach. So I, I think that crowdfunding is a really, I think one of the parts of crowdfunding that could be really, the aspects that could be really uh, sustainable is that you can you can get um, engagement by being by sharing data and by by asking, by asking for interaction with the public. And if you build that into the sort of the, the the funding covenant, then to me that that seems like everyone wins. Scientists get to communicate directly sort of without filters and the public gets to get a sense of how to understand what the pace of, of discovery is and when problems are really, really hard and when it's going to take a lot of effort to, to crack them. But as everyone knows who's, who's done science, though, not, not all experiments work out. And sometimes um, not only do you not get negative results, sometimes you get no results. When you ask for crowdfunding for a project, do you tend to specifically ask for funding for a project that will either produce positive or negative results? I mean, if I, I can just say, you know, in our case, the way we, we tell this, uh, you know, the way we, the way we pitch it in the campaign and the way we're going to talk about it as, this, as, the, as our results start to trickle in is that, you know, this is a really gradual process and that there's, you know, some steps forward, some steps back. And that's, I think people, people in order to have a really, you know, to have a sustainable NPR type model, people are going to have to get accustomed to this kind of the rhythm of, of the way basic discovery happens, and it's choppy. And, and sometimes it's choppy for, I think, bad reasons, because of inefficiencies or because of outdated models. But, but the, it's an intrinsically, you know, this, studying a complex thing is an intrinsically difficult task, and so pe people need to know that. And so I think, these, these, I think the early uh, adopters of science crowdfunding like us need to show by, you know, lead by example and, and just show that as you document a, a basic research project in real time, it's, it's, it's not always, you know, every day is not, you get exactly what you think is going to happen. Uh, this is Jared. Um, in many ways, I actually think Ethan raises a, a great point. One thing we're doing by bringing in audiences to our science is showing them how science works. Um, we're kind of unpacking the black box of science and showing people that it is a, a choppy process full of, uh, you know, messy processes and, and occasional failures. And that's science. And, and, and as scientists, we're used to that. We're familiar with that. But that's not always the perception of science in the, the popular media. Um, so this is one of those great things that we can do as scientists engaging in crowdfunding and bringing people uh, virtually into our labs is actually um, educating and showing this is how science works, and it's, it's kind of a crazy process. Um, so it's, it's a real benefit to bringing people into your work. So a lot of the questions that we're getting from people seem to be on the, the nuts and bolts of crowdfunding. And here's one that we were, uh, just one example of a question we're getting many times, which is, how does this work in terms of taxes? Um, do crowdfunds have to be reported as taxable income? Can they be reported as deductible gifts? Do the backers, uh, can the backers of your, of your project list them as tax deductible? Are they taxed on individual PI's tax returns as personal income? How does that work? 
I mean, Jerry, you want to take a stab at that maybe because I have only lived experience with the with Columbia University Medical School in Princeton. Uh, maybe you have a broader uh, consensus. Yeah, this is uh, this is a problem that this is actually one of the first questions that we've gotten at SciFund from pretty much all of our uh, participants. Um, and the the sort of general answer is that if funds go to you as an individual, yes, you are liable for taxes and as income. And that's precisely why we suggest that. Uh, the crowdfunding organizations that you're working with uh, actually make those checks out to either your university or a nonprofit uh, that you're working for. So this is going to take some interaction between uh, you as a scientist and the funding officers at your universities. And that, acts, uh, <laughs> that interaction is not always friction-free, as uh, crowdfunding is somewhat new. However, um, most of our researchers have been able to strike up very good relationships with their university's funding officers either through the development office uh, or office of, of sponsored programs, something along those lines, uh, and have the funds channeled through the university and therefore incur no tax consequences. Uh, if you're interested in learning about these, uh, my collaborator Jai Ranganathan has, has really gone into this in depth and talked to a lot of different people at different universities. Um, on our blog at scifundchallenge.org, um, we actually have two entries, uh, one called Will Universities Allow You to Raise Money Through Crowdfunding, and another which has the same title but part two. Um, both of those go over how you can channel money uh, into your universities and therefore avoid any tax consequences for yourselves. Uh, and there are some other entries scattered throughout that, again, discuss the tax question. But the sort of take home of it all is uh, don't have the money go to you, have it go to your university uh, or a nonprofit for which you're working, and, and that way you can avoid those tax consequences. Hmm. Here's a question for Ethan or Erica. Um, the question is, do you think you could have successfully raised funding without the tangible rewards that you offered to backers? Yeah. Erica, you want to kick it off? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it's tough to say. I haven't had an experience raising funds with, um, aside from Petri Dish as far as crowdfunding. So, Petri Dish does require you to have um, to provide rewards for your backers. So um, I do wonder, though, if I were to get any more um, backers, if I had offered something with a little bit more pizzazz to it, um, other than just an interview with me or a bracelet from Kenya. You know, there's I've looked through Petri Dish, and there's been some other really interesting um, rewards up there for larger projects that have um, more funding themselves. So uh, personally, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I do, I do believe that it is um, interesting for these folks to go on and, and feel a part of the project. And I think offering rewards kind of makes them feel a part of the project. They get something um, sort of in return for, for what they've done not, and, and also to be able to speak um, with that researcher um, about project specific. So, I think a reward is actually a very important part of the process, but not quite sure if it's the end all as far as getting all the backers. I, I agree. I think that it also depends on who the backers are. I found that a lot of my backers in my social network, like in Facebook, were more likely to decline, uh, whereas I think people maybe who I don't know, that maybe the perk was actually the draw. I mean, I know that definitely I think it's hard to do because we didn't run the control experiment, but I'm pretty sure that if we hadn't offered a 3, 3D methamphetamine molecule that you know, maybe we wouldn't have gotten as many donors at, that, at $25. I'm not sure. But I agree that it's important. But I think going forward, we should figure out ways to better you know, test this, do A-B testing, and then figure out what, what really does matter. But it may end up that it all depends on, on who these people are. Again, I think people in your network might be more willing to just consider they're supporting science or supporting a friend, and so they don't really need anything. And they say, well, you know, just use that money and spend it on the science instead. That actually leads into the next question, and this is directed at everybody, but especially Jarrett. Someone says, I'm interested in the profile of the typical donor. Um, and you, you mentioned that it's uh, often friends and family, but for those who aren't, is it just the person on the street? Are they other researchers? How scientifically literate do they tend to be? That's a great question. Um, and actually, Ethan may be able to talk to this a little bit better. Um, we haven't formally gone through a survey of our donors yet although that is in the cards uh, for some uh, future science fund publications. Um, in general, we did find there was a good signal of friends and family, of course. Um, like I said, your mom likes your science. Um, 
But we found a, there was a, a fairly large contingent of non-friends and family. Uh, there was an effect of, of the scientific audience. Uh, and as we talked to researchers within SciFund, we found that there, there was a good deal of variation. Um, some of them did come through uh, big popular media sites. We had, for example, um, CNN cover one of our projects. We had PZ Myers post something about our project. So it's generally people that are coming in through uh, websites that are favored by people who are fairly scientifically literate and interested in projects that are, are out there uh, that cover sort of their interests in science. Um, we also had some participants do something really interesting, which is contact NGOs or non-governmental organizations and nonprofits whose interests overlapped with the, uh, the, the project itself. And often what those participants did is they didn't necessarily ask for funds, but they said, hey, I have this project that I think your membership base will be interested in. Could you send out information about it? And that proved to be a tremendously successful way to bring in funds from outside of your immediate networks um, and, and really build, again, build that audience for your work by showing your work to a, a sort of preset audience that is interested in what you're doing. Here's another question you wanna, for uh, – oh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Ethan probably has more on this. I mean, I, I could chime in that, uh, you know, in collaboration with NPR, who's doing a story about our uh, project, we, we, we sent a survey monkey to a bunch of our – to all of our donors, and about a third of them responded. And we looked at – we asked people, you know, what they did, where they live, and so on. And what was interesting is it's of the respondents uh, to the survey, about 50% of them were somehow self-identified as a scientist. And that included people, uh, you know, down to the college level up through uh, professors. Uh, the next two biggest uh, chunks of the coalition uh, were people generally involved in IT or computing, um, and so tech savvy. Uh, and there were a lot of also people involved actually in management, uh, whether that's in industry or, in, or sort of, you know, you know non-for-profit institutions. There, was a, there were a lot of uh, those people as well. So I think in the end, people said, well, if it's all scientists funding scientists, it can't possibly uh, be sustainable. Well, I think in these early stages as we're still prototyping, uh, it's not a surprise that people who are either scientists or uh, very sympathetic uh, with scientists and uh, that they would be the people who would fund these kinds of projects. So along those lines, here's another question then. Um, are you under any obligation or do you, uh, do you feel you ought to be any, under any obligation to publish your research in any kind of journal that's accessible to the public for free? Yeah, I mean, I can just uh, – we, we pitched – you know, the way our campaign was, was set up was to say any publications resulting from this work would be in an open access journal, like the PLOS journal. So uh, that, that's, that we made that commitment from the beginning. Erica, same with you? Yeah, actually, I didn't make that commitment, but um, it's something that I'm planning on doing. I never actually even thought of advertising it that way, but it's a good idea. Here's another uh, interesting question. Is this model, does is this, is this exist right now just for the hard sciences or also for the social sciences for um, fields such as uh, economics as well? Um, so I'll, I'll actually take that. This is Jarrett. Uh, we've had political scientists run projects with us. We've had uh, other social scientists run projects with us. We had a, a fantastic project in our last round um, looking at um, – uh, of violence in sort of war-torn countries and its consequences, um, again, from a, a political scientist, uh, Amelia Hoover at Drexel. Um, we've just had some absolutely fantastic projects come through from a wide variety of sciences. And, and I think one of the, the pieces of appeal uh, of crowdfunding is that it, it, it really doesn't have any disciplinary limits. Um, so I think the social sciences are, are going to be an excellent place um, for crowdfunding to expand in the future. I agree. Well, here's a question uh, for Erica. Um, someone noted that you, you had only nine backers for your project. How typical is that? Is that uh, for a project of your size, um, are there typically more or fewer backers for something like that? Yeah, actually, I think it's pretty typical for my type of project. It was a master's thesis, so um, it wasn't a huge undertaking. Um, looking on to other completed projects on Petri Dish, I did see um, similar numbers of backers anywhere between 5 to 15. Uh, so uh, definitely going into it, I thought it was something that I could do. Um, 
especially with my smaller budget. So I think the larger budget you have, actually I think some folks might get scared away from it, but um, with my size of my project, I think nine was, is a good number and um, similar to others as well. Yeah, that, that was my uh, perspective as well. I, I analyzed a lot of sci successful sci-fund sci projects in the run-up to my project uh, launching, and I did some extrapolations. And it, it looked like, based on those projections, we, you know, our campaign in order to raise 25,000 would need 400 to 600 people, and we ended up just just shy of 400. So I think um, ours was, was typical in that regard too. But again, a lot of the sci-fund you know, projects that were successful that I used to do my due diligence to really understand what was possible. Uh, you know, the numbers in the dozens sort of were pretty typical. I think the, the high watermark that was set there was a project to analyze ancient Roman DNA. I think that was one that was written up in CNN, um, and that was $10,000, and I think they had uh, like 175 donors. So those are, those are around the, the orders of magnitude to think about these, these projects. Here's another just sort of logistical question. What do you do with the money before you reach your, your goal, and what actually happens to the money if you don't reach your goal? Or is available uh, the money not available to you to spend at all um, until you've reached your goal? Um, that varies a lot by platform. Um, so actually, uh, Rachel Wheat just published a paper in Trends in Ecology and Evolution this week, um, where she and and uh, well and and me and a few others talk a little bit about what are some of the platforms that are out there. Um, policies on whether or not you get money if you reach your goal or not vary by site. So for example, at Rocket Hub. Uh, you get whatever you make. What differs is the percentage of uh, the funds coming in that they take uh, out. Whereas at Kickstarter, uh, it's an all or nothing model. So it, it really varies by platform. Uh, one thing scientists need to do when engaging in crowdfunding and deciding on how they're going to carry out their project is think about what's the model that they feel like would work for them and then um, look at the different sites and see which of those matches that model. So we've got a couple of um, very interesting questions just to, in general uh, about crowdfunding. One is, and this is for everybody, what do you think, in your opinion, gives projects an edge for success? What makes a project more likely than other projects to be funded? I mean, I think I have a, I have a simple answer. You, you have to hustle. You have to work. Um, and you have to set a realistic goal based on if you're an experimentalist, like I think most of us are, you, you don't do out – you don't – do an outrageous experiment. You, you think about it first. And I think if most of us thought about it and t taking into account the, our experiences and trying to extrapolate, um, this is a very doable experiment. And so I think the, the my one more answer is hustle. Yeah, I like that. And I think also um, having an interesting project, um, for example, my luring cheetahs using a robotic goat <laughs> was uh, pretty interesting to the folks, especially who weren't familiar with more scientific jargon and, and being able to see photographs of what I was going to be using, um, feeling that they could be a part of something kind of interesting like this was helpful. That said, um, one thing that I tried as an experiment during the first round of SciFund, because I had absolutely no idea what to expect, is the, the project that I tried to crowdfund, um, while an incredibly useful, valuable, and essential piece of data, I, uh, I chose a project that didn't immediately have um, sex appeal, as it were. Um, it was quantifying measurement error in diver surveyed data, uh, which really sounds boring, <laughs> frankly. Um, so one of the challenges I set for myself is, can you really take any project and try and find the nugget within it that really is interesting, that drives you as a passionate scientist? Um, because again, let's face it, we didn't get into science for the big bucks. We got into science for the passion. Um, so you can really use your project is a place to show that passion, to showcase it and bring it out, uh, and, and use that as a, a jumping off point to fund work. So I, I really think it is down to um, showing that passion. And then, you know, as Ethan said, it's down to the hustle, doing the outreach work to get people to come in and look at your project. And if they arrive at your project and see something that's really interesting, uh, like Erica's project, something that's really, really cool, or something that um, somebody is deeply passionate about, and is showing you in, in really clean, clear uh, language and with a good story um, that is, is something that's compelling, then, then that will lead to your, your work getting funded. Exactly. I totally agree. So it's definitely hard work, but what are um, 
what are some of the, the disadvantages? And you guys have talked about how great crowdfunding is. Um, a lot of people have been asking, what, what, are, um, what are the downsides to crowdfunding? I don't know. I would just say, what are the downsides to not crowdfunding? I mean, if you're an NIH-funded yeah. scientist, uh, you know, let's be honest here. Unless the NIH doubles its budget, and I don't see the House Republicans doing that anytime soon, uh, you know, we've been we've been suffering from flat budgets for a decade, and with the loss of purchasing power, you know, to do cutting edge biomedical research, um, it's just not going to cut it. So I, I think that clearly, you know, crowdfunding is not going to replace the R1 anytime soon. But to to just not experiment and to not innovate, given you know, I, you know, I viewed my project as a kind of Darwinian imperative because I was I literally ran out of funding, and if I wanted to survive as a scientist, I needed to raise money. So I, I see what are the downsides to, to not trying. They're, to me, they're huge. Hmm. Do other people want to answer that question or should we move on to another one? Yeah, I'll kick in as well. Um, we've all seen in MSF the growth in need for broader impact. Um, that's now a prominent feature of, of pretty much every proposal going in there. If you can come to the table with your broader impact saying, hey, and look, I've already started to crowdfund this project. I'm already making that connection. Again, I think that the potential is huge. Um, using crowdfunding, particularly as we see crowdfunding is great at raising small pools of money, so you can use crowdfunding to sort of bootstrap a project and, and start it up at the very beginning um, and then go to NSF showing that you have that public support and built-in audience. I think that could be absolutely tremendous as a way of, of making your uh, proposal stand out in the future for their broader impact. So uh, a crowdfunded bit of research could uh, could lead to a, a larger bit of funding later, and, and as you said, it won't replace the R01, but here's a, a question about um, how might crowdfunding shift the focus of science from uh, its current focus on big science or even usual slash medium science to um, anything much more, uh, more accessible? Do you think the overall focus of, of science might shift as a result of this? Jared, do you want to take that? Um, Sure. Yeah, that's an interesting question and one that I've, I've thought about a lot um, and still don't have any great answers for. <laughs> um, you know, I think it does create a much better back and forth between science and society uh, that the ideas that scientists are thinking about will be informed really quite a bit better by um, what they see as societally relevant, and in that I really only see an upside. Um, it forces you to think about your work differently. Uh, and if we've, we've seen anything, it's that sort of a diversity of ways of thinking about science can lead you to uh, think in a really sort of nonlinear and interesting way about the problems that you're confronting in your work. So I really see nothing but an upside there. Um, it's enhancing the sort of intellectual space that we occupy as scientists. And if it changes things for that reason, then that's a change that's probably for the better. Yep. Here's a question for uh, for Jared, just so, sort of along those lines as well. Um, what are the implications, if any, for intellectual property generated out of a project that was supported through crowdfunding? How does a scientist using crowdfunding protect his or her intellectual rights? That's an interesting question. We get that question a lot at SciFund, and I will be honest, we have not yet had a project that has had intellectual property concerns. Um, so I really don't feel qualified to answer that. Ethan, I don't know if you've run into that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's more, it comes up more in the NIH world, and that's a question I get a lot, too. Um, and you know, right now, I think it's all sort of uncharted territory. And so I think it's probably now up to discretion of the, the funders. But then again, um, I think this is, you know, first and foremost, I just need to stress this is, this is uncharted territory. So I think as crowdfunding itself evolves as a funding mechanism, right, because it, it's a law of the land now that, that you can do equity-based crowdfunding. And so that's going to change the equation, too, because obviously, you know, it's especially people in the biomedical research community or the life science community like me, everyone understands that there is a potent, you know, application to what we do. So I, I don't know. It's, people are going to have to work this out as they prototype to, you know, to the next levels where they're working on projects where, you know, the question of IP does come up. We've got uh, time for just one more question, and I want to thank everybody for submitting so many questions. We have tons and tons of questions coming in. I apologize we didn't get to yours. Uh, but this last question is um, uh, it's about the role of peer review. Oh, I'm sorry, no, it is not. <laughs> it's a different one. I've marked the wrong one here. Um, it, it's a higher level question, which is, are you guys concerned that crowdfunding will tend to bias funding toward those projects and researchers who are best at hyping their ideas to a lay audience? 
You know, I think right now the system is tilted to, to people who are good at hyping their ideas to a small number of experts who sit in a closed room, at least in the NIH world, and make decisions about what, you know, what, what's going to happen in terms of basic research in, in America. So, you know, I guess, you know, this question comes up a lot. Um, and I don't know, that I, I tend to get into rant mode when this comes up, so maybe, Jared, you can take over from here. Sure. I'll stop you from your rant. <laughs> um, my take on this is it's actually quite the, the opposite. Um, instead of, of saying only those projects that can be well hyped to the public are going to be those that are going to sell, it, it may well be a tool to um, really force scientists to get out of their boxes and to learn to communicate their passion better. Um, like I said, we're scientists. We're passionate about the work we do. That's why we do it. Uh, if this comes online as a real mechanism that is beneficial to scientists uh, and that communicating that passion through really solid outreach is, is something that we find that we have to do as scientists. Again, I'm all in favor of that. You know, I would love for um, every scientist out there to sit down in a compass workshop with Nancy Barron or Liz Neely and that team uh, and learn how to better communicate their science to the public. I, I think if that's, if that's the, the end result of uh, science crowdfunding, then again, it will have served a, a fantastic societal purpose. Amen. Hey, well, thank you all very much. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Well, let me thank Jarrett Burns, Erica Hermson, and Ethan O. Perlstein. You've been a very informative panel on crowdfunding research. Thanks, too, to our audience for your questions. And once again, sorry we couldn't get to them all. I just want to let everyone know that this webinar will be archived for viewing again at memberscentral.aaas.org. Please visit the site for information on future webinars and follow us on Twitter at hashtag AAASWebinar. For AAAS, I am Adam Rubin. Have a good day.